you know, I should go put jeans on and a shirt, just put a t-shirt on, have all my tattoos hanging up, just to show people, like, confirmation bias. Uh, and so keep that in your head for a moment. Okay, so first a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Dr. Iron Price. Hold on, I'm trying to remember that whole list. Uh, I, I, I'm not in the Guinness Book of World Records. I wish I was. Uh, was that true, by the way? Where is it? Doc, is that, oh, you did? I don't know, but it sounded like, I, I hope you made that up, because I have none of that. Uh, so I'm an emergency physician by trade. Uh, I trained at McMaster in Hamilton, Ontario. That's where I currently live. I'm, I did a fellowship in sports medicine, and I worked for about seven years. First, I worked with uh, the Hamilton Ticats for a while. Then I moved on to rugby. Rugby is, was my jam, so I spent uh, seven years as uh, the team physician for varsity rugby at McMaster. Um, and then in 2010, uh, I opened up what at the time was in Ontario, the first clinic dedicated to uh, evaluating patients for medical cannabis. And uh, I've seen probably about 100,000 patient visits since then, maybe more, if we put it all together. Um, nah, maybe 80. So somewhere around that, since that time. And uh, then in, I guess last year, I, uh, I left the Emerge, well, I left in September. Uh, I took a, I'm taking a year break. I just, I sort of started losing humanity a little bit, and I figured I needed to uh, gain, I think anybody who works in Emerge, anybody work in Emerge here, or, into a merge. Imagine going to work, where you go to your job, where 100% of the people you work and interact with, all of them, 100% of the time, are having the worst day of their lives, right? So it becomes like, it be, like nobody's happy, you know? Nobody comes to a merge and is like, hey, I want to tell you this good news. No, nobody does that. They come to a merge because they're dying, so, or they believe they are. So I needed, I needed a break. I took a break from that. Uh, I'm all, although I am a coroner, I'm an investigating coroner in the province of Ontario. So I spend, uh, I spend my time investigating death as well, which uh, one of the reasons I actually did that was because if you want to change policy, you got to do coroner inquests. That's where policies get changed. And so when we're talking about the opioid crisis and we talk about how we can make change, that was one of the places I thought, hmm, this is a good place to start. So I became a coroner. It's actually super rewarding uh, and, and I don't have to talk to people. Well, they're dead. No, you have, to talk, you have to talk to a lot of people. It's like interacting. Anyway, a whole thing. I like the investigation, like who done it? You know, I played Clue, it's like that a little bit, a little CSI. I guess Clue, I don't know. No, I, guess, I don't know. Anyway, so Halloween, I did a murder mystery, if that counts. Um, so, uh, but I was the one killed. So, anyway, okay, so I did all that. And then last year as well, I started a research company called Cannabis Research Associates. Cool acronym, CRA, right? Makes sense, because the CRA stays away from the CRA. They're like, oh, it's a CRA. So, did you get that? No, you're all Canadian, Sean, that accountant should get that. Anyway, so it's called CRA, and uh, what we do is clinical research. I know that we were talking about how is it that we could do, uh, how is it that opioids, or we could do RCTs for cannabinoids? Uh, because it's not one molecule, one receptor, right? It's actually a whole paradigm shift that's happening now. We have a guy, um, uh, Matt Cooper, Dr. Matt Cooper, if anybody's heard of him. He said a really interesting thing to me. Uh, he's a pain doc in, in, uh, in Hamilton. He said, we're so in medicine, we're so accustomed to having nine drugs for one disease, right? You have high blood pressure, we have nine drugs. You have seizures, you have nine drugs. And for all these diseases, medicine, we have nine drugs to try to treat one disease. But now, this whole paradigm shift we have one drug to treat nine diseases. The problem with that is, I only have to produce one drug. So a lot of people aren't happy with that. It's a lot easier to, for you know, big industry and big pharma to make a lot more money when you have nine drugs that partially treat one disease. So this is one of the things that, one of the areas uh, that I try to um, intervene in. And so I did it like I told you before. I went to all these industry guys, I went off to these industry guys, to the uh, licensed producers, and I said, I started talking about market caps. I started talking about market cap for your rec world. I started talking about market cap for, uh, for your pharmaceutical industry. And then I ta started to talk about patient experience. And what our goal is, is the treatment of patients, right? The other paradigm shift that's happening right now is that we're not solely focusing on what did this study show me, but what was the patient outcome. We call that functional outcome measures. 
So there's a lot of paradigms shifting right now within the medical world. So that's one of the, that was sort of like the impetus for starting what I did. So today we're going to be talking about uh, cannabis for opioid substitution. Hold on, I think I need a clicker, so switch. No, nope, it doesn't work like that. My bad. Which one do I press? The green? <laughs> Big one? All right, so just before I get started, disclosure. I am a uh, evidence-based physician. I went to MAC. Everything we do is always disclosed. I have received an honoraria to do this talk and to be here. Uh, previous speaker fees and consulting honoraria. Uh, I got to talk about the disclosure. So <coughs> Tilray, National Access Cannabis, American, NGC, Metro, Canada, all of these people. Um, and, uh, and then on the other side, so some of the cool stuff right now, if you want to learn about insurance, you could go to these two guys at the bottom. And uh, uh, Buywell is an e-commerce platform uh, for health and wellness products, and the insurance will be sold through that, uh, brought to you by Evergreen Pacific. Okay. So, what are my objectives? We're going to be talking about cannabis for opioid replacement, but we have to, we can't just talk about, I, I just don't want to talk about studies because it will drive me nuts and I'll, I'll, I'll fall asleep. So we're going to define the problem. What is the problem in Canada right now? We're going to go through a case. I'm going to take you through a real person's case. She wanted to be here today. She actually wanted to fly out to tell her story. And it's a really cool story. She just couldn't make it. And then uh, we're going to talk about the review of the literature. I'll go through some of the studies that are out there. That's where like the deathly boring shit happens when you start talking about studies and stats. And then I'll talk about the study that I'm currently working, which is the cost study, which is Cannabis for Opioid Substitution Trial. So let's define the problem. We are in the midst, and we've spoken about this before, we're in the midst of the largest crisis for opioids in the history of our reported world. Um, and Canada is in the forefront of that. You know, Canada, relative per capita in the world, has the largest problem with opioid abuse in the world, per capita. I happen to live in a province that has the largest problem in, even though you think that BC would have that problem, <laughs> they don't. Ontario has a larger problem with opioid abuse. And within Ontario, the city that I live in, which is Hamilton, has the largest problem. So in essence, relative per capita, I live in a city that has the largest opioid abuse problem in the world. So we see it every day. And as a coroner, what I can tell you is for the last six months, one in three of the cases I see is related to an opioid overdose or death. Well, I guess as a corner, it's not just an opioid overdose that are, they're dying, right? So they're dying. This is what's happening in our world right now. People are dying. So we need something to do. So let's just look at <coughs> Hamilton, for example. Hamilton, Ontario, we've had, I mean, this is just in the past year, and you can go look these up. We have a, yeah, actually, Canada has a really good reporting system now. Most provinces have an opioid reporting system that you can Google and, uh, and find on the Government of Canada's website. So, for example, our uh, provincial standard is about 7 in 100,000 people die from an opioid overdose. Hamilton, on the other hand, we're up to about 15. So we're over the national standard and over our provincial standard for death. Yeah, see? Everything else is funny. I talk about this shit. It's like death. Anyway, so what do we need to do? How can we change these things? Well, the first thing is we have to define how it is that we treat pain. Currently, our toolbox for the treatment of pain is tiny. It's horrible. You know, I kind of, the example I use is, let's say you're trying to build a home. And you're in that little toolbox kit that they give you. I don't build. I'm Jewish. I try. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's true. No, I try. Um, I, they took my tools away back at the second temple. No? All right. Um, so... The, uh, the toolbox that we use to treat chronic pain is tiny. Example being, you're trying to build a house, and in that toolkit, you're given one nail and a screwdriver. And you're trying to build that house, you take that nail out, and you start smashing the back end of the screwdriver into a wall to start building the house. Eventually, that nail is going to go into that wall, but you're going to wreck everything around it. That's how we treat pain in Canada. That's how we treat, treat pain worldwide. 
But that's, the, that, that's sort of the, the analogy that I can give for it. 11% of our prescriptions that we currently use, you know, it's interesting. When we talk about cannabis, they say there's no indications. You know, I used to hear this all the time. I'll tell you, currently, we have a lot of indications for cannabis, and you'll find that most physicians are open to it. I know we talk about the stigma, and there is a lot of stigma. But if you go back a decade when, we, when I started, the stigma was 99% uh, worse. When I started, about 97%, and Terry probably had the same experience, 97% of my patients were self-referred. 99.9% .9 of the patients that come see us now are all referred from other healthcare practitioners. That's today. So there's a huge shift that's happening, okay? But at the same time, we still hear this stuff, there's no, you know, there's no indication or there's no real first line indication for a medicine. Well, let's look at the National Pain Guideline for how we treat pain. None of them are first line options. Opioids are first line option for the treatment of pain. Who knows what the first line, in our national standard, national guideline for the treatment of chronic pain, what is the first, in, first thing we're supposed to go to? Yoga and Tai Chi. <laughs> that is listed in our national pain guideline. Tai Chi exercise non-pharmacological therapies is the first line treatment for chronic pain. But how many governments provide us that opportunity for the patient to actually go and do that? None, because none of them provide funding for it. Right? It makes it very difficult. So they go to second, third, offline treatment, like totally unindicated treatment. So the off-label use of medicines in general, most of the medicine, a lot of the medicine we use, I should say, is off-label. So the argument when physicians come to me and say, well, there's no indication, I say, what's your indication for using X in this disease process. Oh, do you use uh, anti-convulsants for the treatment of pain? Of course I do. Well, it's an off-label use, right? How many people use Neurontin or Gabapentin for chronic pain? You should listen to the, the CEO. Uh, to, I mean, he was, he was uh, brought to justice for, uh, for, what he, for convincing physicians at the time that uh, Neurontin should be used for everything. Right? So, uh, but it's not its indication. But somehow cannabis has developed this stigma. If we look at children, pediatric medications, 75% of the medications we prescribe to children are used off-label. That's pretty huge. And we're not talking 2%, 3%, we're not even talking about 11%. We're talking 75% of pediatric medications are off-label use. Medicine just currently hasn't caught up to the problem. But maybe it has. The problem that we're facing now is that we're in a world where Big Pharma has controlled it up to this point. I'll tell you, Big Pharma's jumping ship on pharma and coming over to the cannabis world. We've seen that over and over and over again. But somehow, we've done a really good job. How do physicians get educated on studies when it comes to medicines? Anybody have an idea? Right, it's exactly what it is. We don't learn any of this stuff in school. <laughs> Nobody taught me about how to use hydrochlorothiazide until I was in residency, but how did they start learning about those drugs? Some drug rep shows up to your office and does a nice lunch for you and starts telling you about their trials. But somehow their trials are okay. So these are the things that we have to start talking about. This is the conversation that we have to start changing now. And so this is how I approach the physician or the healthcare practitioner when we're talking and we're trying and they're trying to, you know, they come at you when we try to have that discussion. Like I said, we shouldn't argue about cannabis. There's no use to argue with anybody. You're not going to change somebody's mind by arguing, but you can have that discussion. Be prepared. And these are some of the arguments. So one of the other issues is we have an educated population. It's not an issue, it's a good thing. That paradigm shift, we we're talking about the baby boomer. The baby boomer's frustrated, patients are frustrated, they're educated now. We have internet Google, it's not always the best thing to do, but you can do it. You may find out you're all dying, but until that, or the like, telehealth will tell you to go to the emerge. But up until that point, we have an educated population that's no longer willing to accept just the word of a physician. Because at the end of the day, the reason the physician existed was to act as a collaborative helper in having a patient or having a person, a human, treat themselves. I'm not here to treat you. I'm here to help you treat yourself. That's the collaborative nature of medicine. 
And that's where we need to go. And so we have an educated population that's had enough. But then we also have these national pain guidelines. As I mentioned, first line therapy, exercise, yoga, none of these things are adhered to. Non-pharmacological non treatments, those are the first line treatments. Interesting, we talk about cannabis, we talk about uh, THC causing euphoria. And we put it where? Does it go on the benefits or side effect profile? Euphoria. Side effect profile, right? Is somehow feeling euphoric is not good. First indication of benefit for an opioid listed in the National Pain Guideline. What do you think it is? Euphoria. euphoria. Right. So those questions have to be asked. Why is it okay for an opioid to be euphoric but not for a cannabinoid to be euphoric? Right? It doesn't seem to make sense. But, of course, you know, we oh, I don't want to feel high. Well, what, you're how do you define high? What are you connoting? What do you think is going to happen by being high. Now, certainly, we can avoid those things for people that need to or want to, but what's wrong with having an improved quality of life? Not much, right? Now, of course, in certain populations, we have to be careful, but these are the things that we are trying to help others understand. And this is what I call, and what we call in medicine or in science, confirmation bias. We spoke about it, we spoke about it a little earlier on. And this is usually how I start my conversations with people. Confirmation bias is our value system. It's our belief system. It's those things that we were brought up and told by when, from when we were little children by our parents is right and wrong. That's, and, and that is the way that we see the world. Now, it doesn't matter what kind of evidence I put before you. You're going to make that judgment based on your previous experiences. That's called confirmation bias. So sometimes we have to take those blinders off. And unfortunately, we have to talk about evidence because, I mean, as boring as it is, it's really important to understand the evidence as well. So when you have a conversation with somebody that's, uh, I wouldn't say necessarily pro cam just looking for the discussion, start with com understand their confirmation bias. Understand your own confirmation bias. For example, from us that come from already you're preaching to the converted, right? I came from a world of pure medicine of like Western medicine. I wasn't taught a thing about the endocannabinoid system. We were talking about this earlier on. But I was tired and frustrated of seeing patients coming into the eMERGE who were already overdose seeking drugs or dying from, or in acute withdrawal from opioids. So that's my confirmation bias. I came to cannabinoids with that already saying, what well, can be worse than death, right? I mean, so that's my confirmation bias. Understand somebody else's confirmation bias as well. So what is our patient? True story, 46-year-old female with fibromyalgia. I'll tell you, the we already spoke about average ages. You're looking at the average age of the new cannabis users, a 55, 45 to 55-year-old female. That's the average age. So she presents having failed multiple medications, finding herself addicted to opioids and benzodiazepines, uh, like lorazepam and all those things. Uh, she was uh, told that cannabis might help her. She's tried uh, most types of therapy, including massage, yoga, acupuncture. Nothing's really helping. And I write, we're her physician's last hope. I didn't say her last hope because there's always more hope. Physician, on the other hand, we, we, we usually like, eh, that toolbox, it's really small. Eh. And, and what I end up finding in, a, in, uh, in our clinic is that we're people's, we're, a, we're, a clinic, we're like the physician's last hope instead of their, or their last ditch effort instead of their first <coughs> option, right? And I'm sure those in the clinical space, anybody else sort of feel that way, that you're always the last hope? I've tried all these other things and then all of a sudden, we're okay sending them to you. Why not first? Well, that's the confirmation, but well, because a good study showed me that, or some study, probably some pharmaceutical study showed me that I should be putting them on gabapentin first. And then if you've ever tried taking somebody off of gabapentin, you're going to have almost as difficult time as taking somebody off of an opioid. But they, they leave that part up. Anyway, okay, I digress. So, she's told it might help. We're the physician's last hope. We're the last ditch effort. Somehow we're going to, you know, be their knight in shining armor. I don't know. Maybe it'll help. Past medical history for this person is fibromyalgia, chronic neck and back pain, and poor sleep hygiene. This is true, she works as a uh, uh, PSW, a personal support worker in palliative care. She hasn't been able to work in some time. These are her medications. So she's on Percocet, 
this is actually, when she came to me, she had already decreased two of her uh, own Percocet per month, uh, per day. She was on 12 initially, she came to me at 10. So she's on uh, 50 milligrams of oxycodone daily, that's 300 tablets, that equivalent, that's an equivalent of 75 morphine equivalents uh, per day. We have a national standard, a national guideline for the use of, of uh, narcotics. So you're looking, and she actually falls below it in some ways. It used to be up at 200 morphine equivalents. Over the last year, there were some good studies, most of them done out of McMaster. Uh, they wrote the National Pain Guideline that brought it down to 90 morphine equivalents if you're on an opioid. And then if you're if still on opioids, but if you're a new user to opioids, it's 50 morphine equivalents. So she's high for one and low for the other. But either way, she's on 75 morphine equivalents. She's on baclofen, a muscle relaxer, which is also a benzodiazepine. Um, so 10 milligrams three times a day. She's on loraz lorazepam as well. Uh, one milligram three times a day. She's on quetiapine, uh, 50 milligrams at nighttime, Tecta to help with side effects. Seneca and multivitamin. So she's on a whole concoction of shit. Right? <laughs> this, this, this is not listening to all of it. She was yeah. on 13 medications. Yeah. I left out most of them <laughs> off in here because these are the ones that we have to deal with. And, uh, and how do you deal with that? How does somebody who comes into you, understanding the patient, understanding that client, the person, the human sitting in front of you who's experiencing it, Although we can all say opioids are bad for you, we can all sit here and say we should be on cannabinoids. Until you have that person sitting in front of you, you don't understand what that person is going through. That person is still getting relief even if they're on an opioid. They may not even necessarily know how addictive they are. They may not necessarily even want to listen to what you have to say. Because anything is better than nothing when you're in that much pain. So, her uh, intake forms, she's got a, a pain scale score of 17.5. These are all standardized scores. By the way, if you go to any clinic, if you're going to see a doctor for cannabis, you don't need to see a doctor anymore for cannabis. You can go and just recreationally buy it in Canada because it's federally legal. And we were talking about this a little bit earlier. If your goal is to get high, then you don't need medicine. I fully support going to the recreational adult lifestyle market. I do believe in mindful consumption, so if you are going to do it, do it mindfully because it is an amazing plant. But if your goal is to feel euphoric only, you don't need medicine. You can just go to the rec market. As soon as you leave that and start talking about other ailments, well, you're now in the realm of medicine. So if you do happen to go to a doctor, they should be doing all of these things because that's proper care. That's how you treat somebody. Otherwise, what is our goal? To get legal? You don't need that anymore. All right, patient intake forms. I digress. It's not my frustration. Um, 17 and a half out of 20. She's nearly maxed out. Her opioid, we use this thing in opioid risk tool. It says, how likely are you to be addicted to opioids? She's been on them for 10 years and her ORT comes out of zero. So these, the, as, as much as these um, tools are helpful and they'll say, you know, they're all validated in medical trials. It's not very useful in this case, because we already know she, she came and told me she had a problem. She told me she was addicted. But yet her ORT score says zero. Because the ORT score still says, well, if you were female and molested when you were a child, that equals one, because somehow your ORT score goes up with that. Right? So, like, these things are archaic. We're dealing with still a medical world that is, like, that's based on this old patriarchal, I can't, I don't know, you know what I'm trying to say. It's just like ancient. And so that stuff needs to change. So we have this over here. Doesn't seem to make sense. But that's what we have. On history, she has this chronic pain, chest, lower back, knees, hips, the whole thing. Everywhere you can think of. If you have fibro, you're suffering. 18 out of the 20 points on her are all tender. Examination, she's tender to palpate all of these little different areas. So what are our goals of treatment? First thing is we want to decrease her pain response. There is a thing known as hyperanalgesic syndrome. If you take too much opioids, the same thing that we spoke about earlier on, if you take too much cannabinoids, you can end up with hyper, uh, hyperanalgesic syndrome as well. It's this bimodal distribution. Same thing can happen if you take too many opioids. If you're on a high dose, you can end up with hyperanalgesic syndrome. So we want to avoid that. Uh, we want to decrease her pain response though as well. We also uh, we want to decrease her reliance on benzodiazepines. Interesting, 
Withdrawal from opioids won't kill you. You'll feel like shit. You'll feel like, like, like you're going to die, but you won't die. You'll die from overdosing, but not withdrawing. Benzodiazepines, on the other hand, nobody really talks about those too much, right? We don't talk about lorazepam, because it helps them sleep. Uh, we don't talk about clonazepam all the time. We don't talk about those things. But what I can tell you is they're a hell of a lot harder to come off of and will kill you a lot more than opioids will. Freaking awesome. Overdose and withdrawal. It's the same as alcohol. It's metabolized by the same thing. So you hear when you go into alcohol withdrawal, you can die from alcohol withdrawal. The same way you die of alcohol withdrawal from, uh, well, from alcohol, <laughs> you, die of, you can die the same way from benzodiazepines. And then our third and final goal for her is uh, in the goal setting process is her improvement in quality of life. But how do you tell somebody who doesn't necessarily, who wants help, doesn't necessarily, well, thinks they want help, doesn't necessarily know how to go about it, what do you tell this individual when they come to you and they're extremely defensive over their narcotics and they don't really, they're like, hmm, well, my narcotics are really helping me, but my doctor sent me here to see you. How do you explain to them, and they think you're judging them? That's all, like, every, if you're a healthcare practitioner, as soon as you walk in, you think your healthcare practitioner is judging you, right? Hands up. <laughs> and yeah, it, you know, no one's putting their hand up now. No, my doctor doesn't judge me. No, they, they are, but whatever. <laughs> I'm not. I'm, I'm you. Okay, so, um... What do we tell her? I'll tell you, this is kind of how I explained it to her. I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to help you if you want help. I can't change your mind for you. You're the one who's suffering. I want to help you. I'll provide you those tools. But I'm not going to be here and sit here and try to convince you that I'm right over you. You have the right to your life. I can just provide you that information. You want to go ahead and use opioids, you want to go use heroin, you want to use crack, enjoy it. That's your right. I'm not in agreement with it, I'm not going to judge you over it, but if you want help, I'm here. And so that's how I presented it to her. I basically said, it's your life, not mine, you make the decision. I want to help you, I think I can help you, but I'm not going to sit here and say what you're doing is absolutely wrong, and blah 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 blah, I mean, like, that's, not going to, that's not helpful. So. That's basically what I said. I'm not judging you. I'm here to help you, should you want to be helped. Funny enough, eventually I'll tell you what happened. She wrote a book on the whole thing, and all over the media. Anyway, um, that's basically how I presented it. And if you ever speak to people who, are, who do have issues with addiction, being blunt and straightforward, you don't have to hide. They know that it's a problem, some of them. And if they don't know it's a problem, still being straightforward and blunt with them is the nicest thing you could be to them. If you try hiding it and you try, well, it's not this, that doesn't work. You have to be straightforward. So what's the difficulty in her situation? She's on chronic opioid use. It's a difficult transition. Clearly won't kill you, though. Chronic benzodiazepine use, more difficult than opioid transition, but it can kill you in withdrawal. And is the patient ready to change? You know, we use the stages of change, uh, you know, the stages of change uh, uh, form. You know, uh, not ready to change, thinking about changing, ready to change, change. I don't know, something like that. Stage of change. Uh, people, I'm sure, heard of it. Anyway, I can't remember the exact words. But yeah, so uh, she was sort of, I want to change. Ah, uh, maybe I don't. So I'm like, cannabis or opioids? Make a decision. I'll tell you, most people will choose cannabis. Last year, that isn't having to do with Donald Trump, you'll, you'll find that it's usually talking about cannabis and opioids. And you'll find wherever cannabis laws are more lax, opioid use is decreased. Opioid overdoses are decreased. This is just, I mean, this is, and, and most of them look at, you know, they're looking at observational data. Once again, they used a, a cannabis survey. They actually have over 20 participating clinics. They have approached 1,800. Currently, I'll tell you, this was back in December of last year. There are over 2,200 patients in now. And I think there's somewhere around 750 patients who are actually actually completed the survey. That's very large. Okay, when you think of, and I say that because the next one is a little bigger. Because um, wouldn't I show you, right? Yeah, bigger. All right, so 20, 20 clinics, over 1,800 particip participants from BC, Alberta, Ontario, New Brunswick, 
or whatever NS is, I think it's Nova Scotia. All right. So the data on the preliminary or of the preliminary data, 573 patients were enrolled into this study. Oh man, I wish I had a wish I had a phone. Wish I had a rabbit in the hat. Remember that song? I don't know. I don't really. Care. I thought it was a rabbit and I had a six foot father. No, that's not it. Okay. <laughs> That's what I always thought it was. Okay, so um, opioid use percentage of patients using opioids by baseline. Uh, at baseline, we can see that the naive patient percentage of them was all the way up here, and the non-naive cannabis user were all the way over was over here. So we're looking upwards of 30%. But if you look at six, if you look at the six-month baseline or six months uh, after being seen by a physician, you're already looking at like over a 13.6% drop um, in, uh, in cannabis use, in, uh, sorry, in opioid use. Their opioid use had significantly decreased. Now, what is the mean opioid use day? It went from 187 milligrams per day, which is pretty large, down to 48 milligrams per day at six months. That's a 74% reduction. So we're talking about just using cannabis, one drug, medicine, to take away opioids. And this is observational data, of course, but this is good data. And we're looking at 700 patients, and you're looking at a 74% reduction in opioid use. That's huge. I only put those two slides on there because of all of them. I didn't go through the whole methodology and stuff. But that's a huge study. But how do we corroborate that? You have to validate that. That's one study. So let's talk about the study that I'm currently working on. It's called COST, Cannabis for Opioid Substitutional Trial. It's actually sponsored by an LP as well, NGC. You haven't heard of them yet. Um, they will be coming up very shortly. They just got their sales license. But anyways, they're totally committed to doing, uh, to doing research. They're sticking to the medical, medical market. And we've committed three other trials already. So the first trial right now is an observational trial, looking at something similar that... that uh, that uh, Tilray did, but from this trial, we're just about in February going to start our first randomized control trial, looking at a specific strain of or an extract of cannabis for opioid substitution. At the same time, we're starting another trial, looking at RCT randomized control trial, looking at dysmenorrhea, painful menstruation, using a specific strain of cannabinoids. The third study we're looking at is looking at behavior modification in an elderly patient using cannabinoids. So I've been using cannabis in the hospital now for probably eight, seven years. You know, it's on formula uh, in, in our hospital. Not cannabis per se, while well, it is, it's synthetic THC, now alone. Uh, you know, it's interesting, another thing, everybody talks about how, all the problems that we have. Oh, you can't use THC, it has to be CBD. But yet, every doctor seems like it's okay to prescribe nabalone doesn't make sense. Nabalone is synthetic THC. That's all it is. But if you tell a doctor that, they're like, oh, but it has a DIN number. Because pharma did a really good job at blinding us all together, especially doctors. So we have it on formulary in the hospital. I've been using it for years. I'm one of the only doctors in the hospital that does it, which is great because it's always available to me. Uh, but it's a lot safer than using things like Haldol, antipsychotics, and lorazepam to, or Ativan, to keep somebody sedated. Why? Because now they just either like sort of doze off a little bit or they smile. <laughs> and, and, and you can talk about the most aggressive people in locked down wards with severe dementia, giving them a little THC and all of a sudden they go from that to like, ah, I'm ready for my pizza. Anyway, <laughs> so, uh, cannabis substitution. This is the trial I'm working on now. Uh, yeah, we just basically, oh, I should, I guess I should say it was done by, so it's done by myself as the lead investigator on it, and uh, my, my partner is Dr. Sunil Patty. he's um, a methodologist out of Ontario as well. By the way, I should tell you this is the first time we're talking about this study, and it's only because I got permission from them over time, over the last week, I have to keep some of the data out of it uh, as disclosure, but, uh, so I won't be able to go into the strains that people are using. Uh, the, the major point of the, there's two major points. Are people decreasing their opioid use? If so, which strains are they using? And uh, to do that. Interesting, what I will tell you, uh, which is how I'm setting up the RCT, the randomized control trial, 
is that from the 830 patients we currently have enrolled, uh, the two top strains are totally opposite of each other. They're from two totally different worlds. So the question is why? Is it the THC? Is it the CBD? We know there's 125 other cannabinoids in these strains. We also know there's terpenes in these strains and flavonoids. So is the combination of all of them that's causing this? Or is it something else we don't even know about? So we're reverse engineering these things. It's all coming down now. And this stuff has all happened in Canada. Totally easy to do. You just have to get Health Canada approval. So what do we use? We have an online survey as well. Um, we have five clinics. We have 1,700 uh, participants that have been approached. Our sample size that we're going for is 1,200, and the results to date have been collected via survey. One of them, uh, one of the ways that we collected is via Survey Monkey. It's just a way to do shit online. Anyway, so we have 1,123 consented patients. Of that, 864 patients have been enrolled. Uh, prior to November 30th, 2018. So we're very close. To my knowledge, it's the largest trial of its kind uh, to date on um, uh, cannabis for opioid substitution. So what are some of the demographics and age that we're finding? I think it's all very consistent. You know, uh, you know, prior prior speakers have spoken, have talked about how you know the, it's mostly the females. It's mostly the older, pa older baby booming population, etc. You know, most of our research is all showing the same stuff. So even though we haven't done all these RCTs, when we do do them, it just confirms. I said do do. When we do dash do them, it does confirm. I'm a child. Yeah. I tell you, I'm like an infant. Uh, it does confirm what we already know, right? And it's just and we seem to get the same confirmation confirmation every time we do another trial. So how much more do we actually have to do? It doesn't make sense. So 55% of these people are, uh, are female, uh, ages uh, between 55 and 64, uh, that's the largest, or 55 and 64 is 26% of them. So females between 55 and 64, that is the average age of the people that have entered this trial. So what are the primary conditions? So we looked at, for cannabis, for opioid substitution, we looked at all chronic pain diseases uh, and pain populations. So chronic pain was the number one. But then, you know, you break it down into back and neck problems, arthritis, all the way down into spinal cord injuries. All right. This is crazy data. Like, you can't make this shit up. Reduction in prescription opioid use since using medical cannabis. An N of 824 people. 83% have reduced using their opioids since beginning cannabis. 83%. Doesn't make sense. By how much? The period, first we'll talk about period. So, time period of reduction, over how long? Over 30% within three months. The rest of them within one year. It's pretty crazy. Now, Quantity of reduction. By how much have you reduced it? Let me get out of your way so you can all see that. How much have you reduced your cannabis use? Over 55% of the patients in this study have decreased their opioid use by 100%. What? But then we go to how many have reduced by 75%? 20%. How many by 50%? Another 10%. How much a little less than that? 25%. 10%. So over 90% of the people in this study have decreased their opioid use. But there's no evidence. Doesn't make sense. Right? Doesn't make sense. So this is the stuff, I mean, it's not published yet, so in all fairness, nobody really knows this except the people in this room. <laughs> so now you could go out and tell people. Absolutely insane. Cannabis for, uh, versus opioid. So what controls their, what controls their pain better? So 71, so let's say 72% of participants reported that medical cannabis provides better pain control than their prescription opioids. Um, and that's 837 patients. So if we're talking about, does cannabis help? I mean, the, you know, I know uh, proof is in the pudding. Well, in this case, the proof is right here. It's in the cannabis. Like, the patient will tell you the patient, the research is backing the data, the, the data is backing the evidence that we've already had that was anecdotal, let's say. 
but somehow we still have to deal with that stigma, right? So the first thing we have to do, like I said, is get over that confirmation bias. You can show people this evidence all day, but if they're coming to you with that confirmation bias and they don't care if somebody, I was just going to offend everybody that believes in God in here, but I'll leave it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, I did that one time too. I got tattooed. Oh my dad, oh my God. Anyway, I hid them for 40 years. Um, so, <laughs> I don't forgot where I was. Um, right. Something about confirmation bias and God. So, if, we, if, if, if we're trying to convince, you're not going to convince somebody who isn't ready to listen. So you have to come to them with that argument. It's not an argument with that, I don't know, with the discussion, I call it an argument. But you have to be prepared to understand where they're coming from. How did they grow up? The context of how they grew up is just important, as important to the conversation as your own upbringing. So we have to understand their side in order to communicate with them. So this is what I do for more, most of the uh, most physicians. I bring them the evidence because they want to hear evidence. So you want to argue with me? Argue with me after I show you the evidence. Then let's have a discussion because that's what it becomes. So back to our patient. By year one, she's off of 13 medications and she's only using medical cannabis. She wrote a book. She's gone on speaking to her. She's been on, uh, oh, on the media all the time. Now this is a woman that I literally sat there and said, the decision is yours. I'm not making this decision for you. If you want help, I'll help you. If you don't, then there's nothing I can do. When you're ready, come back and see me. I can't help somebody that's not ready to help themselves. Right? So, just in summary, can cannabis be used as a replacement for opioids? Well, we certainly have compelling evidence in the clinical realm that it can be. It's not for everybody. Does cannabis work for everybody? No. I use like a five-person approach when people say, Doc, is it going to cure me? And I say, well, for out of five people, it'll work amazing for two of you. It'll work okay for one, and it'll do nothing for two others. It's not for everybody. It comes with side effects. It, it like, like Dr. Hepburn said before, it's not, it's not good and it's not bad. It's everything to everybody. Everybody's an individual. It'll be different for every person. The good news is, and where I am willing to make a stand, is say that it is safe. It is certainly safe, and I think we've proven that over and over again. If it's been used for 7,500 years, and it was unsafe, we'd have bodies piled up to the sky, but we don't. Right? It's safe. It's definitely safer than an opioid. It's definitely safer than a benzodiazepine, and it's definitely safer than an antipsychotic. All of which are used off-label. So why is it not okay to use a, can a cannabinoid off-label? Well, it's not even off-label because we have the research. There's more research on the use of cannabis in chronic pain than there is for opioids in chronic pain. But this evidence just needs to come to life. It's not for everybody. But we are dealing with that paradigm shift right now. So finally, like, you know, do we need an RCT to start looking at if cannabis is a good alternative to an opioid? Do we need to do that right now or should we already be doing it? The argument that I'm making is that we should have already been doing it. Because what we find ourselves in now is a crisis that we're going to have another hundred years to get out of. Because I'll tell you, it's not going down yet. It's still going yeah, yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. Because it's a lot easier to say, take two of these and go home, than sit with somebody, and it's a very complex, it's a complex situation. It's not like we can, you know, when I say it's more difficult to sit with somebody and collaborate with them, it's not as simple as just that, because that's time, that's resources, that's money. Those are things that our government doesn't provide to us. But one thing that the BC government did do was sue the pharmaceutical companies for creating this problem. And that's a, excuse me, that is a huge, that is a huge step forward, right? So they've had enough. They're, they're suing them for their treatment, for the treatment plan. So we're in this position right now. So how do we change it? Well, it starts with the people right here. Because we've had the talk about how to deal with uh, with the stigma around it. Now we're talking about the evidence that's behind it. And this is a very large growing body of evidence that's happening. These, they, like, when, when people publish trials, they publish trials with like 100 people. We're talking almost thousands of people, right, in trials. If we combine these two things together, you're talking nearly 2,000 people in, one tri in, in trials. Just from two, two studies. So the evidence is there and we just need to start using it.
Um, we have a question. You mentioned the two people that it doesn't work at all. Do we understand physiologically what's wrong with their ECS that it doesn't work at all? I mean, it, the, there? The, no, <laughs> it, not yet. So we know that the uh, endocannabinoid system is super complex, right? Um, we know that a dysregulation of it can cause havoc on our body, right? It's, it's, you know, so it's really important for homeostasis and to maintain that level of balance that we have. So for the two people that it doesn't work for, I mean, you, what you have to do is go and test their, you'd have to do individualized testing for them to find out what's wrong with their uh, endocannabinoid system. We are getting to that point, by the way. There are people that are doing DNA, we have DNA prints all the time happening now. We know, you know, here's the crazy thing. We you know we can individualize antibiotic therapy for people and antiviral um, uh, therapy for people. We just have to do their DNA. We can tell you what you're resist. We can tell you what's going to help you for forever. But we don't do those things. Medicine just has not caught up yet. Even though we have the available data, there, right? We're getting there. It's just really slow. Anyway, okay, so that's it. My boring presentation is done. I tried to like make it as unboring as possible. All right, questions. Everybody, uh, you add one. For, I'll get to you, Doc, in a sec. By the way, so um, <clears throat> just one comment. I think uh, your what you're showing is very important. I know several pediatric uh, patients that have uh, come off of opioids uh, in two weeks after being treated mm -hmm. with. Uh, and we're talking about somebody, a kid that had osteosarcoma, very painful bone cancer, 20 tumors. Anyways, uh, so I think this is fantastic. Question for you, do you have to have, are you licensed? Do you have to be licensed to conduct the research that you're conducting? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm licensed as a physician to conduct research. If I was not a physician, I would not be able to conduct research without a license as like a company. But as, but a, as a physician, you can. As a physician, I can cool. conduct research. Okay, awesome. I'm not, by the way, I'm not questioning. I'm no, just no, simply that's out of why curiosity. I do it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good question. It comes up all the time. Okay. <laughs> Where's the license for your car? I'm, I'm a physician. <laughs> Somehow they put a white coat on, everyone trusts you. <laughs> <laughs> there have been a few small, I call them pilot RCTs, um, that have looked at that way. But I really like the study. It's a perfect example of what I was talking about community based exactly. and research. Um, but the thing is that once you move into the RCTs, the effect size always goes down. Yeah. And so the ones that have been done, it's like maybe 13% in the placebo group and 26% in the um, in the active uh, treated group. So I, I uh, is 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 it, is it that is it worth it? Something that you're doing in your clinic is different than what's done in the studies, or? Well. Um, first, it's not just in our clinic. We do this, it's like a multi-center observational study. Um, it's a good question. It's, uh, I think it all comes down to the methodology of the study. That's, you know, it, are you studying the question that you're trying to answer? And most studies don't. They're, they're designed, they're designed for, like, well not most. A lot of studies are flawed in their design. I think if you study the, if your study design for example, when we do our design, I'm not going to do a superiority trial because I'll never prove superiority of cannabis over opioids. But I'll do a non-inferiority trial, you know, to tell you that it's not less harmful, right? So that, and if you design them in that way, I think your your uh, your effect size is going to be a lot a lot bigger. That's that's a word that's what we're aiming for anyway. And is there any evidence? I mean, the problem with the opioids is not just that they're addictive. Is that their efficacy drops so fast? Yes, and, so and you just got to keep going up. That's the dose. Yeah, just, just to maintain. Yeah, your your dose keeps chasing, going up and up and up. Chasing the tail of the dragon. All the that's time. all the time. Is there any evidence that that's happening with with cannabis or is cannabis? I haven't seen that. I, I don't see you know the increasing uh, dose required. Now there are chronic. You know, I I've actually come up with ways around that. I get chronic users that come to me and say. Doc, I need 20 grams a day. I hear this shit all the time. <laughs> I, and you're talking to somebody that knows about cannabis, so I'm not like your usual doctor. And uh, and so like these guys are like, I need 20 grams a day because I do this extraction and I get one gram per blah blah. And I'm like, I could take you right through your. Let's go through your equation. And where's your cannabis now? So, but what I tell people that are chronic users of cannabis and say I have a high tolerance is, do a washout period, 
because it washes out really quickly, and uh, change your stream or your chemo bar or whatever, chemo type, blah, 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 we can take, call it all these names, but change your stream. Change your stream and do a washout period, and you're going to be okay. You don't need all that. Change your strain. Have your different strains for different times of the days, and don't just use the same strains. And you won't get those, at least that's what I found from the thousands that I've treated. Just a side comment to that. I mean, I literally grow two strains, and I keep the same strains in, in this cycle. And uh, I found, for me, something that's a one-to-one, -one, I'll never get uh, normalized. Yeah, I mean, I think there's so much individuality behind it, one to one, one to three, three to one. I don't, you know, at the end of the day, it's hard to even say. So when I created, like, the dosing guidelines that I created were are based on um, starting at a specific point. I base, it, I, I base THC on a, uh, on a bioavailability sort of perspective. You know how you say that smoking isn't uh, as... Or as good as vaping, you have the same 10, 10 milligram dose. Well, clearly it's not because the bioavailability of smoking or combusting cannabis is like 10 to 20 percent, where it's 50 percent bioavailable when you vaporize. So of course you're going to get to use a lot less, you know. So I do dosing based on that kind of thing, and then uh, not necessarily based on the ratio. I'm just going to ask a question. No. <laughs> Next. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a doctor, but... Um, That's, you're lucky. Um, Some days I am, it depends what the college thinks. We have about seven doctors in my family. Oh, wow. None of them <coughs> support the use of cannabis. Yeah. Okay. In no shape or form. Yeah. Where are they? A lot of them in the Caribbean, some of them are here in Canada, some of them... They're going to come Europe. around in the Caribbean. And... Um, We've been there. They the smoked cannabis when they were young. Yeah. They, they smoked, everyone smoked, or you, you inhaled it as a second... Second hand because yeah. of the you, you got high anyways. Yeah. But what I was saying was that is there any study that shows the, the use of cannabinoids among doctors themselves for relieving pain? You know what's doctors? funny? Here's a funny story. So last year I ski a lot, right? I, uh, I didn't bring my, I usually put slides up of me somewhere skiing. So last year I was in Chatter, Chatter Creek, you know, Chatter Creek out golden, like all the way. Anyway, cat skiing, doing this thing. And then, uh, so I used to sell a vaporizer in my clinic called the Da Vinci. We've all heard of the Da Vinci. And, uh, which is a really good, a really good uh, vaporizer. But I was then with a bunch of eMERGE docs. And uh, who, I'll tell you, for the first eight years were like, Ira, what are you doing? I was looked at like I was the craziest person alive. All of a sudden, we're like in the chalet, and this dude pulls out a vaporizer. And he's an eMERGE doc. And they all start vaping. I'm like, oh, oh, I see where this is going. All right, all right, yeah. So they use it. They're just closet users. <laughs> they all use it. Helps them get off cocaine. Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Hyperalgesic syndrome. So patients that use a lot of cannabis, like I don't have a specific dose, how much, but I'd say daily users that are using over three grams a day of like smoked cannabis. And what about the other ones? Ah, I don't, I haven't, to be honest, we've only had like uh, oils on the market since 2016. So uh, we, we haven't had, we don't, I have no data on that. I don't know if Terry has any on, on, on hyperanalgesic syndrome. I, I don't I actually haven't looked at that, to be honest. It's, it's actually a really good, That'd be a good study. Good thought. I'm really grateful for the work that you're doing there, Thank appropriate you. induction, and also tied in with what MJ Malloy is doing here at UBC. Yeah. I've been doing a couple of years and we've some really significant Agreed. The concern I have for a host of other medical conditions is that what is being provided by DLPs is a very, very restricted range of chemobiotics. You need a lot more. Agreed. A lot more for it. Yes. Thoughts on it. So my thoughts are, we can, if you have the proper chemist, you can uh, extract any, you can create any chemo bar you want. You can create an extract, let's say an oil extract, from one strain, from one chemo bar, you can turn it into anything. So that's kind of what we did, and most of the chemists are doing that now. So let's say we got two top strains. I re reverse engineered them, plowed them out, did like uh, old, um, what are those things? Um, 
can't even remember the name of it. Anyway, some researchy thing. And uh, plot, blots, western blots, there we go. Western blot of them, find out which, uh, which uh, cannabinoids are in there, which terpenes are in there, and then mix them back together so that you have a whole new uh, extraction. You have a whole new, or isolate or distillate, whatever it is, you have a whole new, uh, a whole new oil that never existed, or extract that never existed before based on those two things that you found. That's what's sort of what I think is going to start happening. But yes, the LPs currently uh, are, in the, uh, are in a very, very narrow market, but I also think they're hoarding a lot of their shit so that, um, and I'll call them all out, they're hoarding it for, for a recreational thing. Now the recreational market is going to have a larger variety over time, but where Canada is maybe ahead of the game in terms of the medical use and the legalization, where we're like centuries behind is in our chemo bars and strains. You go to places like California, and you go to like Jungle Boys, or you go to like some of these guys that are growing strains that you never like, they'll just knock, just like blow, blow you away with how precise they are and their tissue cultures and the way that they, 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 uh, they function in terms of reproducibility that we just don't have here yet. We're going to get there, we're going to bring in more talent and we'll get there eventually. What about cancer treatment? Even one second. Last That's thing. Another, another question. Right? Yeah. A lot of the no, sure. issue of financing for, uh, for, for medication for specific population has a lot to do with the political decision in terms of priorities. Yes. In, in the UK, if you did a study like that, among the age of, say, say your target of your, your, your target group was within the age of those who were retired, that, that, this is, that, that result would be very persuasive to the British government in terms of the provision that they would make for pain relief among that age group because they pay for it. You'd think so, yes. I mean, that, I mean that's how cannabis became more, when the, that's how cannabis stopped losing its stigma early in the 60s and 70s because, yes, but, but because, because you had a my, growing middle class political population. Experience, political. I see a lot of influence by the, the companies whose, whose decisions are important for the, the politicians to maintain their funding stream. Yes. That's exactly what happens. We don't really see it. It's about, it comes it's down like, to, comes down to their the GPD, GDP, GDP. Uh, and if they can make money off of it, the government is into it. That's what they. That's why a lot of countries uh, internationally just want to grow and sell it back here because they're they're not interested in necessarily what help, helps the people. They're interested in being able to sell it and improving their gross domestic product. So that I mean, so I don't disagree with you. We could talk about cancer offline. Uh, there's there's a role. It's like you know what I always say. I'll say the last thing. We talk about cancer. Um, and I, I used this analogy earlier on. Does cancer, does cannabis treat cancer? Certainly, there's a lot of, there is evidence, there's a large mountain uh, po um, a population of evidence, of data, that cannabis can, can help in specific cancers. I do firmly believe that over time, we will be able to cure uh, glioblastoma um, from, with, use, with the use of cannabinoids. Um, and neuroblastoma, brain cancer, we will be able to cure it using cannabis. Are we there now? Not yet. You know, when somebody comes to me and says, I want to use cannabis for cancer, I say, I'm going to give you three doors. This is what we said earlier on. You have uh, $100 million under door, and I'll tell you what's behind the doors. You have $100 million behind door A, you have $10 million behind door B, and then door C, I'll give you both A and B. Which door do you want? Come on, this is like not a trick fucking question. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the easiest question you'll ever get. Do you want a hundred million dollars, ten million dollars, or a hundred and ten million dollars? <laughs> Which is door C? Which door do you want, people? Sure. Okay, Thank go. you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Door A, your hundred million is your traditional therapy for cancer currently, your chemo and your radiation. It could cure you. It will. In a lot of cases, we have lots of evidence for it. It'll cure your cancer and kill you at the same time. That's what it does. We know that. Door B is your cannabis. It's like your 10 million. It's working its way up, but it's not there yet. Door C, take both right now. Right? So currently, take both. If you're going to go down the option of even entertaining it. If you're not going to entertain using chemo or radiation to treat your cancer, then you've got to be willing to die. Or you have to be willing to accept the consequences of using nothing. Because... I mean, and just doing whatever you can to try to survive. You just have to accept that. 
Whereas your survival rate is probably higher if you are using things like chemoradiation currently. Now, your cure rate. You may die from immunocompromise or radiation lung or all the other shit that is going to happen to you from getting radiation chemo. But at the same time, we don't have that evidence. It's still mounting, it's out there, and it's growing. It's just not there yet. We need That's the research where we need to do. Right now, neuroblastoma, glioblastoma, brain cancers, I think those are the first things we can cure. Okay, guys, I'm done. Thank you.